time right now is 442. 442. We are taping. Mr. Charlie Bells, we want to thank you for taking the opportunity to interview with us for the Voice in Action project with East, for East Cleveland. For the record, can you state your name and your title? My name is Charles E. Bibb Sr. Presently, I am the Vice President of the East Cleveland Public Library. Okay. We'd like to also just get right into the interview. Can you tell us about yourself and the history of your family? Yes, I can. My family migrated to Cleveland, Ohio from Montgomery, Alabama. I was probably at the age of four or five, and I was the oldest of three children. One sister, two years younger than me. Another sister was born in Cleveland 14 years later. I went to Rollins, went to Kinsman Elementary, and East Tech, the okay. old East Tech. The old East Tech, okay. And your family came to Cleveland what year? Don't have the year exactly. Okay. But uh, probably about 75 years ago. Okay, okay. And you came here with whom? My mother and my father. Okay. And when you came to, when your parents came to Cleveland, they came here for what purpose? Better opportunities. The opportunities at that time in the United States was in the north. Okay. And when you got to Cleveland, you were, were what age? Four or five years old. Okay, you yeah. said four or five years old. So you don't remember the transition? No, I can remember on the train with the box and the pound cake and the apple and the banana and the chick fried chicken. And being that uh, small age, your family members were older, younger, your siblings? My sister was two years younger than me. Okay. One sister was born in Cleveland okay. 14 years later. And with your family members being so small, what part of town did y'all stay on? We moved to 82nd and Kinsman, which was an integrated neighborhood at the time. Was that uh, area populated by what, what race? Hungarian and African Americans. Okay. And what memories, when your family came, you played with the other kids within the neighborhood? Yes. We stayed right on the same playgrounds at Kinsman Elementary School and at the park. Okay. So having that, uh, the diversity in the neighborhoods, you play with the kids inside or outside, mainly? Mainly outside. Okay. okay. And with your family history transitioning, did other people in your family come? No, we were the ones, I had an uncle came up ahead of us. In those days, one part of the family would go up and secure a job or something, and then when they were here, they were asked to look out for the rest of the family and have someone else move up. Okay. And when you, when y'all stayed on 89th and Quincy. 80, did, 82nd and Kinsman. 82nd and Kinsman. From that area, what was the second place that you moved to, to, to venture out? Tell me about venturing out towards East Cleveland. Well, we moved into the Huff area then that was integrated, 93rd and Huff. We stayed down the street called Ainsbury. But I didn't leave there until I was grown. When I graduated from East Tech, I was living on 82nd and Kinsman. Okay. And, and at that time, uh, living there, you, your first main place you lived on your own was where? In Glenville. Okay. Street called Somerset. Somerset. Okay. And during that period of time, what led you to the East Cleveland? Did you did someone tell you about East Cleveland, or you knew about East Cleveland? At that time, in East Cleveland was uh, integrating, started to integrate, and opportunities were East. 
and the move from Glenville in the early 60s to uh, East Cleveland. And what did your other siblings do while you were uh, moving? The one, the youngest one, moved to East Cleveland also. And she stayed with my mother and father. I stayed in another house in East Cleveland. Okay. And what, what career was your sister involved in? She went to Shaw High School, the 14 year old, younger one. And the other one didn't have a job. She had settled policy. Okay. So she didn't work at no. that time. And what was the, the career like with your sister? They're both living now. Okay. And they, what was their career path? One was AmeriCorps. She retired from AmeriCorps Peace Corps. Okay, okay. And, and, and your first encounter with East Cleveland was where and what were you doing at that time? I moved on a street called 131st. And after I moved off 131st in East Cleveland, I moved on Evington, up off of Superior Road. Okay. And then and, and off of there, I moved down to Garfield Road. Okay, okay. And what career were you in, into at that time? I, I had a production company, Bib Enterprises. We did fashion shows, and we did beauty pageants. I did the first Miss Black Ohio beauty pageant back in the 60s. Back in the 60s. How was that experience for you? Quite an experience. We had a monopoly on the black beauty pageants until the uh, late 60s, they began to integrate the Miss University contest. And then that, at that time, the African American started going to the Miss University contest. And the uh, Miss Black America and Miss Black Ohio kind of disintegrated. Okay, okay. And at that time, you met a lot of people. Yes. Okay. And, and once you were in East Cleveland, you had established business there, correct? Right. I moved in East Cleveland in the early 60s, and probably about 63, 62, I opened my build record shop. Okay. What was that? It, what it, was that? It was at Euclid Superior, not the shopping center there now. There was a different shopping center there, but it still was the center of town, Euclid Superior. It was very difficult getting in the building because it was all Caucasians in the building. And the Browns were real popular then. And I found out that the bank owned the building, and it was the bank in the building, they owned the building, that he was a friend of the Browns. And uh, he liked the Browns, and I had Jim Brown call out here to East Cleveland to verify that Bill would be a good business person for East Cleveland. And was that rewarding to you? Very rewarding. Okay. In what way? We had about a 30-year run and we made it in the record business. And when the integration of the record became popular, black record, they called it crossover, and white records crossed over, there's no longer needed an African-American record shop. You needed a multiracial record shop. And that's when the big record shops came about, like Peaches and Tower Records and what have you. And they didn't need the mom and pop record stores anymore. Okay. And it sounded like that was so rewarding for you to have it there. And that's Euclid and Superior. So at that point, it was a, a, a good location for you. Very good location. Very good location. We also had a ticket business. We sold tickets for shows at downtown and for the front row. And we had a very lucrative business until a thing came along called Ticketron, all electronic tickets. He wasn't doing them by hand anymore, so that go that good job. And everybody used to come to you to get their, their records tickets and, and tickets. tickets and, right. So it seemed like you knew a lot of people. Right. You was well known. Well known. Who well, was the most uh, famous person that came to your record shop? Okay. Probably the most famous was the athletes. Muhammad Ali came to my shop. Jim Brown. And the Reverend Sam Titmore, who also played for the Browns. Okay, okay. The politicians came later on when we opened the second beer record shop on Euclid and Taylor. Coming from Lou Stokes, George Forbes, Arnold Pinkney, who they all inspired us to go into politics in East Cleveland. 
And East Cleveland at the time had a former government called Commission, City Manager Former Government. And in 1985, we changed that former government to a Mayor Council Former Government. And Attorney Daryl Pittman was our first mayor elected. Oh, great. Let me go into my next question. Can you think back to your earliest memory of East Cleveland and tell us what life was like then? Yes, my early memories of East Cleveland, probably the biggest shock was my sister was going to Shaw High School and coming from Cleveland, we had never encountered uniforms, but they had nice little uniforms. Everybody had to wear uniforms in school. Their uh, shoes, all the shoes and their blouses and skirts all had to match. And that was quite challenging. And in those days they had swimming. It was required that you go swimming as a part of your education. And I'm surprised now in East Cleveland we don't even have a public swimming pool and we don't have a swimming pool in the school system. Does that bother you? Absolutely. Okay. Why does that have a big effect on you? Because now we have African Americans going into Olympics, the Olympics this year, yes. who are swimmers. In East Cleveland, you can't even go in the swimming pool to learn how to swim to take on a challenge like that. And it's a great career. Great career. And you would like to have a, the, the swimming pool should have been a part of East Cleveland, and it was where? We had a swimming pool on Shaw Avenue, and we had the Co-op Center. We had Co-op, we had a swimming pool up at Shaw High School. Well attended, was that a well attended? Well attended, yeah. And we had two hotels with swimming pools at them. And at this point, to your knowledge, we don't have any. Any swimming pool. No. Okay. And when you mentioned the Olympics, what effect do you think that the swimming pool would have had on the Olympics if we would have had one? Since just yesterday, uh, one of these Cleveland graduates, Tally, was an All-American put into the Hall of Fame coming out of Shaw High School. That could have very well been a swimmer coming out of Shaw High School this year. And he was known for? Football. Football. And he went to Shaw? Yes. Okay. It, is he still here in, Sh in East Cleveland? No, he's not in East Cleveland. Now. Okay. But he went, he's in the Hall of Fame at great. this point? At, Shaw, at Shaw's Hall of Fame. Okay. That's great. That's yeah. a wonderful thing. Just leading next to the next question is, what are your fondest memories of East Cleveland? Well, GE probably is our biggest one. At one point, the GE Christmas lighting was the biggest Christmas lighting in the country. Since GE produced lights, and you were able to drive all up in to the uh, company, or the plant, so to speak, and see all the lights, Christmas lights that you could see, driving without getting out of your car. That was quite a beautiful sight. Now you, they put the Christmas lights on, no, you can ride past them, but they don't have them like they used to. We had a place called the Ski Hill, where I taught my son how to ski. We had an ice skating ring, where I taught my son how to ice skate. And the shopping center at Euclid Superior used to be two floors. Up over King's Shoes used to be a bowling alley. I taught my son Charles E. Bibb Jr. how to bowl. Okay. And when you mentioned that the GE, which is still up and running now, is that correct? Correct. Okay. At one point, it used to be a a a company that you can drive through and see all the beautiful lights. People came Christmas from all light, around. Christmas yeah, lights, yeah. Okay. But it still has the wonderful display during the Christmas season. Right. Correct? You have you can see it on Nova Road, but you don't go up into the plant. Okay. Drive through the plant. So it's, it's the famous GE light companies that we use every, every day. day. Right. But at, but at that time, you used to have access inside, inside of right, it, but right. you just ride by it now. Right. Do you think they still have the same uh, type of that, uh, lights, that, the amount of lights that they had? They don't have nearly as many lights as they used to have. Okay. okay. It was like going to an amusement park uh, and you would go there. And it's during the Christmas holidays during only. During the Christmas holidays. Okay. Well known throughout well, the city? Throughout the country. Oh, throughout the country. So people came all around. Because this was see. GE's World Headquarters. Oh, okay. Here and we had place. lights that people never had. Wow. Is it still... Uh, the uh, lights are beautiful, yet yeah, just as not as many. Okay. Okay. That was a fondest mem memory to you. Right. Okay. 
And going to just go uh, going to the next question, right into the next question. In what ways has the city changed over time? Well, it went uh, from a majority European American when we moved here in the early 60s to so now 95 to 98 percent African American. And you've we, seen it coming? It was a working class community when we moved and now has changed. The families, 73 percent, 75 percent are headed by single women. So single head of household, is that correct? Right. Okay. So what do you think contributed to those changes? Well, Cleveland had a lot to do with it. As it developed in Cleveland, and they started tearing down the homes, like in Huff from the riots, they moved east, and they started to move into East Cleveland, and we got more than our portion of people who were not working. It is not a African-American situation that changed us, for a while, Warrenville had the same amount of population, but they had working people. We have people that were on public assistance in East Cleveland. What year was that that you noticed the change with the different percentage that you just mentioned? In the early 70s, it started to change. The European Americans started to move out. Did you notice this on your own, or you can just, was it something that was projected? Well, it was projected, but we noticed it also because I had two businesses in East Cleveland and it was visible. You could see the change. You could see the change in the school system. There's more and more African American in the system. When they would have their extracurricular activities, it switched. Do you feel that was good or bad? Well, because of the unemployment that we had, and people that didn't have jobs, that was a bad mark on us. We could not afford to run the city like we did in the past. Along with the people, European Americans moving, some of the larger business moved. And we just got another hit just this year when Cleveland Clinic moved with 850 jobs. And the year before last, the post office took 100 jobs out of East Cleveland and took them to Cleveland Heights. And at that time, during that period of time, you were a council person, correct? I was a council person in 2001 to 2003. And during that period of the, 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 the two years that you was in council, you knew the impact prior to Coming being on in council, that. right. Okay. So you had first hand in seeing what was going on. Absolutely. That was one of the reasons that we changed the form of government. As a result of us changing the form of government, we were able to talk to Congressman Stokes, who was chairing a subcommittee in Congress and become a direct entitlement city. Up until then, the county would use our demographics to get the money and then decide how much they would spend in East Cleveland. But as a result of Congressman Stokes sitting on the Appropriations Committee, we were able to become a direct entitlement city. Now we get our own money direct from the government and spend it like we want to. So before it was like a middleman. Yeah, the county would use our demographic, all that unemployment, all the low-income families, get that, then get the pot of money. Yes, sir. And the money came down to the county, and the county, they would decide what we would get. So we were able to change that. When did it become the direct, what the money came directly to East Cleveland? Probably in the late 80s, because we changed the government in 85, and right after that, we started to work on that. What was your initiative to get into politics? What drove you to become a council person? Well, I was in politics before I came to East Cleveland. And I worked in Cleveland with Carl Stokes as mayor. And then later on, when Lou Stokes ran for Congress, we helped him. That's why we were able to use our connection with the Stokes family to help us in East Cleveland. And with you being the elected official at that time, what was the first initiative that you either started or amended or ended? I'm glad you asked that question. When I came on council, we hadn't built a new house in 25 years. But having a relationship with Metropolitan Housing, 
we were able to use that. And I was in War II, and we built the first house on 125th and Phillip in 25 years. Okay. Was that rewarding to you? Very rewarding because they had got bogged down in council and the mayor's office, and we were able to cut through that and continue to build houses. How many did you build at that time? I think during my time, we might have wound up with about eight to ten houses. And, and, and the person that you beat in, in city council for Ward 2 was? Uh, H. Elizabeth Omar was the council person at that time. Okay. And with your time there, were you pleased of the position that you had? Very much, because I ran on the team and our team won. When your team win, and you get the most votes. What would you tell the young people nowadays concerning running for elected office in East Cleveland? Start early as you can. Get involved. Help somebody. You, when you volunteer, you learn by volunteering. And now we're in a group. I'm in a group called the Carnegie Roundtable, which I'm the president. We are looking for people under 50 who want to get in politics or civic community activists because we have something that we want to share with them that we can pass the baton in the black community we don't pass the baton enough that's why we have to start all over when Carl Stokes was the mayor he was the first African American elected mayor in a major city in the United States after he came out of office it took us 20 years to get another African American so with the new group that that's implemented now who is the main focus point you're looking for? I know you gave me a, a age demographic. What would be an ideal candidate that you would just, just recommend? Just be ready to be involved in politics and community activists. And what would you do for them? You would, would tell them what? We bring them on and take, see where they are and work with them. We have such an event coming up this, this month, next month, Sunday, August the 5th. We'll be at the East Cleveland main library and the performing arts center with a massive voter registration drive because the turnout in East Cleveland is one of the lowest in the state. Okay. So, well, go ahead, so we're going to do voter registration and voter education. Okay. With this being a Thursday, uh, July the 19th, 2012, and being here with you, uh, Mr. Bibbs, is definitely rewarding. And the group that you um, mention and you want people to run for office, Would are you mentoring them for a certain period of time? Certainly. If they come in and get busy, we have a goal in mind of having them ready to be ready to get in the middle of it, to jump right in the water of elected politics and community activists. They go hand in hand. One of the things that drives politics, you must have activists outside to push the inside. Okay. And another thing too, um, just to, to stay there at that particular point where you mentioned and you want to get uh, more people involved, you want more people involved for change, of course. That's, that's the mission, correct? Correct. Okay. And also to learn the knowledge base of it too. Correct. And not always to run, but just to understand the system. Yeah, not to run just for run, to run to change. See, most people don't even know what, what we're doing. They don't understand government. Let me give you a figure. 50% of the people who are eligible to vote are not registered. And 50% of the people who are registered don't vote. What caused that to happen? Apathy. They lose hope. That's why Obama ran on hope and change. Okay. And then that, that would lead to my next question. How has race and racism impacted you personally? Well, it started at an early age. When I say it was, I was 82nd and Kinsman, that's when my family came to Cleveland. And at the swimming pool, what is, at that time it's called Wood Hill, but now it's Luke Easter Park. The African American had to be on one end of the pool and the white people on the other. And in the larger community at Euclid Beach, Whites had it swum on one side of the beach and blacks the other. And when you went to Euclid Beach Park, blacks were not allowed to skate it. And we could skate all over the whites, but you couldn't skate. 
So you you witnessed this with your own two eyes. Oh yeah, oh yeah, okay. yeah. Okay. And when you so that contribute to race or racism, you think? No, I think I was the witness of it, so that meant that I had to work to try to change it. And what would, what did you do to change it? Well, we got involved with the NAACP, the Urban League, National Action Network. Those groups are? National groups, but they have local affiliates. Okay. And were they strong back in that period of time? Yes, that's why we were able to get Carl Stokes elected mayor okay. and Lou Stokes elected Congress. Okay. And on down, once we started to get African American elected, we just went straight on down the road. Uh, this year, there's a young lady named Yvette, Yvette McGee Brown running for the Supreme Court. She was appointed by Governor Strickland, and it's time for her to run in this November election, but most people don't know it. Is she one of the, the people that are involved in the organization in, that you mentioned? But she involved? can't get involved directly because she's on the bench, but she was just in this Cleveland this past week to speak to the churches. And the second part to the question is, how has race and racism impacted the city of East Cleveland? Uh, the city of East Cleveland, we are the poorest city in the county. We have uh, too many people without jobs. And as you know, in America, right as we speak today, the unemployment is eight point two percent for everybody, but it's less than five percent for European Americans, but it's close to twenty percent for African Americans. So with those kind of numbers, it's difficult for us to catch up. And with us having the amount of unemployment we have in East Cleveland, that impacts it. What would you suggest that East Cleveland do to combat the twenty percent of unemployment, what what would you do if you had the power and position to, what would you suggest that the people start doing right. or implement? Right. For the older citizens, we need retraining because a lot of the jobs, like in the steel mills, they don't exist anymore, so they must be retrained. That's basically for 50 and over. And for the young youngsters in school, they must stay in school and we must get more technical programs for those in school who are not going to college. Okay. And technical programs, well, give me a prime example that you would consider a technical program that you would like East Cleveland to implement. Okay. When I spoke to you earlier about I was on, I didn't tell you the name of the committee, but uh, it was contracts and properties. And I would like to see us redo houses, use the kids out of Shaw High School, train them how to redo houses, renovate them, and build them from scratch. So if they learn it and it, in a semester's time, you have a new group of people ready to go to work. And the disappointed part, while I was in council, we were not able to build any private houses. All those were public houses. But I'd like to see us build a private home. Okay. So the public housing was people who was on public assistance yes. or a, a single family home. Single family home, but on public assistance. Okay. And when you does it does that bother you that the older plus generation is not being trained and the younger people or are not utilizing their or have places they can go to get technical skills? Yeah, we don't have enough now. Uh, we talked to our county council yesterday, Julian Rogers. The county has a hundred million dollar program now that uh, want to help with small businesses that can employ people. But most instances, they got to be trained. And if we can get those in school, we don't have to pay extra to train them. So we have to change the curriculum at Shell High School for the jobs that are available. Okay. Give me an example of what jobs that are available. The service industry now and the health industry, uh, Cleveland Clinic, the one at 93rd and uh, Euclid 
came to East Cleveland to try to get nurses. They need 600 nurses. So they had, we had a week at the library in East Cleveland trying to recruit African Americans to go into nursing. It come to mind right away. Okay, okay. And just leading on to the next question, how has the inequality impacted you personally? Inequality. You mean in East Cleveland? Correct. Um, impacted you personally in uh, the second part. How does it? How has it impacted East Cleveland? Well, I would say it impacted me personally because after almost 30 years in the record business and seeing the business go down because the population went down and the expendable cash that the families had who were left were able to sustain the type of life that they were living before. So that I would consider that a personal impact. And what, what about East Cleveland? Could you mention? Yeah, for East Cleveland. Because my businesses were in East Cleveland. Okay. Right. Okay. And you're saying that that has, that the inequality has a impact on your business. Right. And, and not in my particular, my business not in particular, but in general, uh, we had a business association, East Cleveland Business Association, had a hundred businesses, African Americans in it. Now those businesses are gone. You say, we had two hotels in East Cleveland owned by African Americans. We had a theater owned by African Americans. Bowling alley owned by African Americans. What percentage now is owned by African Americans? Very small. Compared to? Say 20 years ago. 20 years ago. Yeah. And 20 years ago is really not a long time. No. For an example, you could Superior, uh, downtown, we got the one business that I seen when it came to East Cleveland. King's Men's Shoes and Red's Clothing. Did a long one for 40 years. Every business up at, on both sides, uh, Asian, European Americans, Arabs. One, just one. Did you see this coming, or you felt this difference in the um, the the business changing? We did see it in a way, because we were witnessing it. We it wasn't, you know, doing it in a blind, but there was very little that we could do about it because we wasn't controlling the banks and the lending. And when the housing market came in, you heard a redlining. They wouldn't do that. That's a good question leading to my next question is, can you recall a memory or incident when the city fought for something? When the city community fought for something? Yeah, they fought to keep the Huron Hospital in East Cleveland. But they took it away. How and do when you they feel about that? I'm awfully mad, awfully mad, awfully mad because the hospital had 850 employees. We won't get 850 new people working for the next 10 years. Along with that, they took the trauma center. The nearest trauma center is on the west side and in Hillcrest. We have probably four or five people have died because they couldn't get to the trauma center. We don't have an emergency room. We have a health clinic that's open from nine to five. If you're at Eugene Superior and you get in a bad accident, you got to ride 25 minutes. To the closest one. Okay. And with those, the, the Huron Road Hospital employees leaving, and you said at least about 850, correct? Correct. Okay. And you, why, why would you say t it would take another 10 years to have those many people working at another establishment? Because since Cleveland Clinic left, other places will be getting the clothes. Which ones? We have uh, right down the street, Kentucky Fried Chicken clothes. Not coming back. Pizza Hut clothes. Not coming back. It's a pattern. 
At one time, we had five new car dealerships in East Cleveland. But they're not coming back. When you mentioned that they're not coming back for what reasons would contribute to them not coming back? Because the population here is basically unemployed. The, I quoted a 20% unemployment. It's probably close to 40% in East Cleveland. And that's a fact? And, and with youth, it's more than that. Okay, youth. But when you mentioned that you're working with one of the county people to get for people to get retrained, do you have any hope or desire yeah. that other companies will replace the ones that yeah. left? I'm working with Julian Rogers, who is our county representative. That plans are on the books. Yeah, they have $100 million to help pe people who want to have businesses that can employ people. So are they looking for businesses that are now in existing or new? Either way, that you can expand your business or you can grow a new business. You have to show that you're going to get people employed. Okay. So with the monies that we're not talking about something that in the far future, we're talking about things that can be done now. Is right that correct? now. Right, right now. now. And your interview is on time. We just met with Rogers last night. County Council Rogers about the money coming from the casino and uh, we were really upset about it because the county executive want to keep all the money downtown and we believe that the money should be shared with the suburbs and especially the inner ring suburbs and when I talk to them I tell them the casino starts at Stokes Windermere Rapid because you go in that rapid and you come right up inside of the casino. The only casino in the United States that has the rapid transfer that comes up inside. So we are part of the casino and we want, we want a part of the revenue. And how was that uh, outcome? They're working on it now and we're going to be uh, calling the community together. They have not come up with the plan on how they're going to do the money. What you just gave was valuable information and I'm just so honored to, to interview you to know this information and which was going to be shared with the community. How are or which ways are the people, the higher up, is going to get this message out to the common everyday person? Would you be able to answer that question? Because the young people that I told you that we're looking for, they come with another level of experience and knowledge that the old school didn't have. You have all the communication weapons now. We intend to use those and let them know that we're here. We don't have to use the taxes we did in the past. And when you mention um, getting the message out, is there, do they need to, to, to keep in contact with our county elected official or what place can they go in East Cleveland to, to, to get on board? The East Cleveland Public Library will be the mecca because you, and I don't like to use that, we did fight to keep the library system in East Cleveland and under its control. So we're going to use that at the Mecca. That's why we started with the voter registration drive and education. Okay. And would you, would you agree that the voter registration drive will be a kickoff for bigger and brighter things to come? You hit the nail on the head. Absolutely. Okay. But that, that's a good question to lead into my next uh, uh, segment. It's a, how have the surrounding institutions and cities impacted East Cleveland? Now that Case Western Reserve and the University Circle is landlocked, they're beginning to notice East Cleveland, and I think we'll be able to collaborate. They've had the first instance of that with an apartment complex called Circle East. It sits in East Cleveland. And basically, it's supported by the people in Universal Circle. And they intend to have more of that. When I was on council, with, this was War II. We want to develop from Lakeview to Superior Euclid. And now, at this point, on Lakeview, they are starting to build 
homes are those condominiums Condominium. or apartments? Condominiums. Okay. So are they a, a, a affordable for the East Cleveland residents? No. To your knowledge? No. Okay. So who would be the the primary people in there and how will East Cleveland benefit? The ones that we train and get ready for the new jobs. Okay. Okay. So that's something that you're doing in the future? Doing it as we speak. Okay, that's a wonderful thing. So leading on to my next question, what is your vision for a future of East Cleveland? That's the part one. First we have to we don't have to do any more studies in East Cleveland because we know where we are. For an example, we towed out 150 houses in the last year. They haven't built one. Okay. In the last year, 150 homes were yeah. demolished. Is that correct? And at, at that point, nothing has been developed and on the books to build anything yeah. else. No, we're not building anything. Else. Okay. But we got some on the books, so we have to expedite it. Okay. Okay. And with the new condominiums on Lakeview, can you see East Cleveland getting any of those revenues from there? Well, we'll get the regular re revenue from them because it'll be people paying tax who live here. Okay. What, do you know what street it starts? Is that a, At Lakeview and, and Euclid. That's part of East Cleveland. Right. So right underneath that bridge. Right. Okay. okay. And the second part to the question is, tell me about the major ins issues that need addressing in order to better our neighborhood, our community, and our city? Well, right now, we are in a physical watch, the city itself. So we have to get that straight. We got two months. We had four months to do it. We got about two months to get that together. A plan of action, how we're going to reduce our deficit. Then we can start to do other things. So um, if you can elab elaborate on that part when you said that the city of East Cleveland on a physical watch, that means that someone else has an eye on East Cleveland? Yes, yeah, the state of Ohio, okay. not some, the state of Ohio. Okay. If, if that's happening, is that good or bad? That's bad. That's bad. So they want East Cleveland government to tell them in the next several months what they're going to do to get out of the... Correct. Situation. Right. And if they do, then what happens? If they don't, then what happens? If they do, we'll be able to govern like we want to. If they don't come together on a plan to eliminate the debt, the state will appoint a commission. And we don't want that to happen. So appointing a commission is never good? No. It happened in Detroit to eight cities already. There's a city called Stanton in Pennsylvania, everybody's pay was reduced to minimum pay from the mayor on down. And how would the average everyday person keep abreast of what's going on in, with, with that valuable information? They haven't been able to keep up with it now. The average person don't know this is going on. Okay. But I read you back to, we intend to make the library the mecca for information. Okay. We have everything you need there. And speaking about the library, and at this point, East Cleveland still owns that library, is that correct? Absolutely. Okay. And you are on the library board, correct? Vice Chairman. Okay. With you being on the board, you've been on the board for how long? This time, about four months. I was on the board before I went to council for 10 years. Okay. So at this time, you, 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 just several months. Right. And at one point, you was there for 10 years. Yeah. Um, the... Trustees who own the library, they all quit after they couldn't uh, give it to the county. It was too much for them. But we bring it back. Okay. We, it's in the black now. We're going to keep it in the black. With you being on a, a school board for that long period of time and years, and now being just a few months, but you have more experience now. You come with a wealth of knowledge now. Thank you, you. Do you know that you can move it forward? or have a clear vision compared to when you was there before? I'm trying to do an analysis. Right. Without a doubt, it was, you said school board, what you meant, the library the board. The library department. Library. Spent 10 years there before. Was on a, at a convention in Las Vegas. 
and they were our chairman of the Buildings and Grounds at the library, and found out that we could use public money to get the kind of uh, performing arts center that we had, it just blew my mind. I didn't know because we had never traveled outside. And we came back and did that with private money. That's not taxpayers' money. Okay. That's a four million dollar institution. Okay. And we know how to do that now. Okay. So with the knowledge that you have now and been around and, and been exposed, that has helped you out. So you <laughs> You correct. crystal clear on what needs correct. to be done correct. and how it needs to be done, correct? correct? correct. Uh, let me just ask you a closing question and do some follow-up closing questions with you. What would you be prepared to do to participate in making East Cleveland better? Well, I've retired three times. And every time I get mad, I have to come out of retirement. I had to come out of retirement to fight Cleveland Clinic about taking the hospital. I had to come out of retirement to fight the post office, and that was a big fight. A hundred jobs, and those are all good jobs. Those are not the fast food jobs. Those are jobs paying 16, 17, 18, 20 plus dollars an hour. So now I'm back again. I have a goal for myself to have to have, do this in two years. Two years. So I can do my final retirement. Okay. So you think this time would be the uh, golden opportunity for you to retire? Yes. Okay. Let me just say this in, in closing, uh, Mr. Charlie Beer. I want to say it, it's just been an honor to interview you, and you bring a lot of wealth to the table and knowledge. Thank you. You're so and, kind. And, and I, I, I would like to be able to say and have this uh, a taping so that the common person can see and see that as hope and people are doing stuff. And, and, and I would love for you to look into the camera and tell people, the common person that's out here struggling but, but want to do better, what would you tell them? Look into the camera and give us your uh, passion on your opinion, and then I'm going to have uh, two closing questions, and then I'm going to give it to my colleague. Well, the number one thing is to get involved. Get involved at all levels, whether it be at the PTA or the, I don't know if they even call it PTA anymore. Get involved. Go to the meetings of the taxpayers' meetings, school board meetings, council meetings, library board meetings. Get involved. Once you get involved, you'll see that you can make a difference. One of the reasons that things are going down in East Cleveland so fast, not enough people are involved. I was just fortunate enough to come along when it paid to get involved. I started a long time ago being involved. I, uh, I started with Martin Luther King of getting involved. You got to be involved. This is on the. Can you see the date on there? 1965. 1965. Yes, sir. I, you see what I was doing? Ooh wee. Yes, with see two that? heavy hitters. Yeah, that was one with Martin Luther King. That's that's like one with the president. Yes, sir. Okay. Yes, sir. Then on down the road, Al Sharpton, who's been involved all his life. That's George Edwards, there. that's who's on it talking to him. We're trying to help the black contractors get jobs in the county. We had to jump on the county, county, county last year because it wasn't high in African Americans. And so that led me to the big, the granddad of them all. That's Obama and Senator Brown. This is what getting involved will lead you. Okay. 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 This I is why we have to stay register to vote and turn out to vote. It's all, it's all about voting. Okay. And when you mention um, um, that, that, that is just so powerful, the pictures, I'm going to um, see if my uh, colleague, uh, Brandon King, has a question, then I'll close it out. I don't have any questions. I'd like to thank you for retaping, and I'm going to still try with the university to access parts of your other taping, because your other taping has some dynamite information in it and some historic facts right. kind of help us understand how the city came from what it was to where it is yeah. and then your thoughts for it to move forward right. in the future. So I'm if still you, pushing to have that tape. If so you can, can take access. that tape and work with it, yes. and president of my board is the expert in this field, William Flambro. That's what he do. That's yeah, what he do for the bro. city. Yeah. So this will merge it together. We got an opportunity. If you bring me some young people under 50, you'll see it turn around. Uh, Mr. Beers, uh, 
I want to ask the closing question, and then I want to say that this is some powerful information. We're not just talking about what could and should. No. You're actually telling us that this can happen. So hope is, is, is definitely a good part to see and hear and feel. So I want to just take thank you um, once again for coming and being so passionate to come back for the retaping. And I would uh, agree with my colleague, uh, Mr. Brandon King, that we're going to combine them because it, it was powerful. Yeah, right. um, you was lightweight at that time, but you brought us some new up to date. So I feel that you're heavyweight now. Uh, so you're a heavyweight boxer. And I always believe in teamwork makes the dream work. Right. So it brings me great joy to just sit here again and get filled again. Mm. And it's always good to have fire in, in your belly. And right. each time I'm doing the taping with, with, with my colleague, I just get higher and higher and higher that I know it can be done. It's not an if or may. This is something that's possible with cool. me being in Georgia and seeing it being done. Right. I ha know it firsthand it can be done. Right. It can be possible, that, so I'm just so excited about it. Did you have anything else? Yeah, I want to share up? with you. We just, just started to put this together Monday at the, breakfast, at the lunch we had for Reverend Crockett, who was our top guy in the Carnegie Roundtable. He passed. So we said we we're going to do something in his honor. So this is how it starts. You can get a chance to ride this one now. This is the big event. We just started to put that together for the August 5th at the library. Okay. okay. Well, listen, we're, I'll uh, take this information and uh, take it to heart and share it with my colleague. But we want to uh, tell you that you are definitely a part and in, in, in of East Cleveland and definitely a piece that needs to be expressed so people can know what's going on and if you can just give one closing sentence for the people who don't have hope what would you tell them if you are in that position where you lost hope there's always a chance of you getting your hope back you have to apply yourself come out we're here willing to able to help you we have some tools that we didn't have before if we did it with little tools I know you can do it with the new tools if you show any kind of initiative we're gonna help you we got enough of the ones around who want to help that will help if they will to help well thank you thank you thank you once again it brings me joy we're gonna wrap this up mr. Charlie Bibbs and I'm wishing you a great success looking forward to it and we need it to come down to the um, East Cleveland Library to, uh, to do anything that we can to bring it out to the community that East Cleveland is back, live in a living cover with Mr. Okay. Charlie Bills, right. and we are so excited. Now, I, I would be thrilled. I want to ask you this. Do me a favor. I want you to cover this event. We got some other people covering it, but I want you to cover it also. Well, we, we, so you have the beginning of the new East Cleveland. Okay. Well, let me just say this. I'm not the authority figure. We'll pass the word on. But we will pass along. I want to say thank you once again. We're going to wrap this up, and we're just going to say thank you, thank you, thank you in closing. Thank you. Bless you.